All right, folks, can you hear me? Just give me a response back to that tweet I just posted. I'd appreciate it if you could hear me. Everyone that's asking to, to speak with me, I'm going to ignore your request respectfully. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing on this thing. <laughs> it's just trial and error. All right, is the audio clear? And is the volume good? Thank you, J-Rod. Awesome, awesome. All right, so um, give me one second longer. I appreciate your patience, but it looks like it's going to be pretty quiet this morning so far. There's no real news to speak of, and just give me a couple more seconds to get my charts. Or I want to All right, so if you watching live or listening live, I should say, if you take your e mini SMP chart and open it to the 15 minute time frame, okay, and overnight it ran up in took the balance of the position I had on from yesterday's three o'clock short opportunity. And that example was uh, hopefully insightful to you all. A lot of discussion about what was shown in my tweet yesterday without really going through it. A couple beta mails out there chit-chatting, not really picking up on the narrative. But uh, this is the invitation. I'm just going to place this in the beginning. If all you out there that are you know, like educators and want to be gurus and traders and stuff, um, why don't you start showing your statements so everybody can know you can trade too? Because uh, I think it's been raised up now. The bar has been raised saying you took a trade and talking about something doesn't work anymore. All right. So I believe because we have no real news this morning. Um, think about what we have seen this week so far for the index futures. The big smash down day we had on Wednesday, the outside day with the down close, the fact that we didn't take out May 12th low on SPOOs, even the S&P, and NASDAQ failed to take its low out, but on the Dow, and I know a lot of you guys are questioning all the time. Why don't I ever talk about Dow? I don't trade the Dow. Okay, I don't trade it, but I do incorporate it with my analysis between the three averages. So anyway, the point is this. We had a big smash down day on Thursday, outside day with the down close. Generally, I like outside days with down closes when the market's bullish. Now, let's say this market has been going up. Okay, and I think we have a little bit upside this morning. Let me just preface it by saying all that. I don't think there's anything to do at the very moment. Uh, I want to see what we do at 930. I'll probably hang out with you until around 10 o'clock and then I have to escape. Uh, but, you know, I'll try to talk with you about some things that I think may be useful to you and also uh, review what we did yesterday, a little bit more detail. But the idea of a outside day with a down close, if it's bullish, I teach that pattern as a setup that's usually bullish that goes into the next few days after that. 
because we have been going lower, we've been going lower into May at the seasonal tenancy I outlined in the mentorship on YouTube. Now you've all watched that transpire. So if we look for days that have outside day down close in a market that's bearish by itself, it just means it's likely to continue lower. But if we are met with what we have here, we are at the end of the week. You know, Thursday we had a mixed day. Didn't really continue going lower. Didn't make a new lower low. Uh, the, the three averages have not confirmed one another with the lower low on the daily chart. So if you take a look at your E-mini S&P June 2022 contract, and you'll notice the relationship between Thursday's low versus May 12th's low, it wasn't able to make that lower low compared to the 12th on May. Same thing with the NASDAQ, but we did get it lower on the Dow. So by itself, you know, that's, I guess if you want to use it as like a Dow theory, uh, the, the averages have not confirmed. And we're at the end of the week. We don't really have any news today. So it could potentially be a very lackluster trading session going by face value, looking at what we have right now. But obviously all that can change at 930 when the equities market opens up and things start getting moving around. So we'll see what we get in regards to that. But I wanted to kind of like roll back a little bit on the discussion with yesterday's whole entire day. The whole point was, and for those that have actually been with me for a while, you know this to be true. And even the folks out there that have my mentorship, whether it's been by hook or by crook, <laughs> you know what I say in that mentorship. I talk about how on big down days or large range days, the big ranges beget small ranges and small ranges beget large ranges. I learned that from Larry Williams, and I think it's a truism. It's going to never fall out of style. It's real. When there's a lot of excitement, when there's an interest in a market, that's when everybody else feels comfortable going in. And I don't want anybody to take one or two of those tweets that were given yesterday, which I obviously assaulted most of you. <laughs> uh, that's not my intention with the Twitter, uh, but I made an attempt to walk you through a day which i guess in retrospect looking at how i guess this is a lot easier but i wasn't confident that i was going to make it work so i had my son next to me and i was going to just basically translate what i was giving him with you so if i've given you a lot of tweets or you're wondering like man what did i sign up <laughs> i'm not going to continuously do that obviously but the session yesterday was really geared towards you know how to avoid blowing your focusing on the real manipulation and the move that takes place in the day and how we moved and gyrated around that initial fair value gap i gave you the levels and showed you in the video on youtube last night in episode 32 of the 2022 mentorship series on my youtube channel it just kept going above and below and then gravitating right back to that fair value gap just stayed within that range. It only went up a little bit just to take the buy stops and very, very shallow declines. And as soon as you determine, if you haven't really got that much experience yet in trading, the the, so, the, the sooner you can find out that you're in a day like that, better. And you, then you're met with, do I continuously watch the market or do I wait to the last hour of trading? And that's kind of like the takeaway from yesterday. You're going to learn by failure that you're not going to see these things coming all the time. But as a precursor, just know ahead of time when we have big down days and there's a large range day and we're near the end of a daily range and we're within the last few trading sessions and now you know, for weeks and a month or so, we've been bearish. We've been seeing the indices go lower since the beginning of April or so. I'm not calling the bottom. I'm not trying to pick the bottom. But if you're going to be day trading or studying price intraday, you have to be aware of what may transpire after you see these big down days, especially if you see a outside day with a down close near the end of the price run. 
And what I mean by the end of price run, it, if you refer back to the low made on May 12th versus the April highs on your daily chart, that whole entire price swing, we're near the end of it right now this week, but we didn't get a lower low on Thursday with NAS or Spoos. We got it with Dow. So while I don't trade the Dow and why don't I trade it? It's to me, I think it's a little too sloppy. It's erratic. And I'd, I'd prefer to be in S and P S and P will have the cleaner price moves. NASDAQ, if I'm in an idea that is parabolic, in other words, I think the market's really going to run. I think it's going to really take off and have a big range day. I want to try to trade in the NASDAQ because I want that because it tends to exaggerate everything when it's a big move. Other people may say, well, I'm not going to trade the NASDAQ because it's going to rip my face off and I'll slow down and go into the S&P. I'm not like that. And you've seen me do that. I've done it with live trades, live account. It's I'm not afraid of that. You won't be afraid of it either, but it doesn't mean it's an invitation for you to go out there and risk a lot of money. And everything I teach you should be viewed in the context of paper trading and demo. But I've kind of like wanted to go into this year, like I mentioned last year, of trying to prove to everyone that there's no reason for you not to go in and look at this stuff on your own and see it for yourself. But invariably, when you do these things, like Murphy's Law, whatever can go wrong will. And as a new student, it's very easily, easily found for a new student to be discouraged because of initial adversities. And if you started, like, for instance, if say you signed up for this whole business of ICT mentorship, ICT concepts, smart money concepts, whatever, and you started learning yesterday, that is going to be a huge hurdle and it's going to create a lot of doubt and confusion because the intraday range was choppy. It was sideways. And that was more or less what I was walking you through. Go back and look at the tweets and you'll see that's the, you can't just take one tweet out of there and say, oh, look, he did this. He did that. He didn't do this. He didn't do that. The whole context was stay out of the marketplace because we went to 50 50. So 50 50 means we're going to be in consolidation. Consolidation means wait till the last hour of trading. It doesn't mean you're going to get it right. It doesn't mean I'm going to get it right. It just means that as soon as you realize you're in a choppy range bound market, especially with index futures, this is predominantly linked to just index trading. This is not a Forex idea. I don't like Forex, you know, after noon, to be honest with you, noon local time, New York. But if you noticed how we were just holding that range and ran up for the buy side, as I was outlining in the tweet yesterday, the whole context of what I was taking you through, a lot of traders just want me to, or students, I should say, want me to just get to the point, give me a, give me a way to buy or sell, pick my entry, give me a way to determine where my stop loss should be, tell me how to move my stop, when should I move my stop, and give me a target. And the fact expecting that to be understood, because I've already done all of that, like that's already on YouTube right now. The problem is there's so many variables to how the market's going to book, present, what I mean by present, that it gives you opportunity. And sometimes it gives you these impressions that it may be a good day to trade, but then all of a sudden, as soon as you press the button, it does what it did yesterday. and can be very frustrating. I can tell you as a younger man in my 20s, when I first started trading the S&P, we didn't have these big ranges back then in the 90s. They were, they were nowhere near the, the level of volatility that's available to all of us now. But the idea of getting in on those days like yesterday when I was a young man, I would be in there trying to capture every continuation, bull flag, bear flag, the whole business. I would go after everything I possibly to anticipate the next run but only on the upside because i was a buyer i didn't want to short anything but i would literally blow my accounts out all the time with those types of days so you have to know what leads to those events so that way you can avoid it or at least know that once you're in it and you've taken a loss or two you have to learn how to stop 
Like you have to stop and not do any more trading. And when it's easy and the markets are real primed and we're not primed to do anything exciting yet. I'm, I'm watching the charts as I'm talking to you. So don't think I'm not paying attention to it. When it's easy to see the market drawing to a particular high or a particular low and it's one sided, that's what I teach as a low resistance liquidity run. Okay, where you have just a real easy run to an objective. It's so one sided. You can't even argue about the possibility of an opposite perspective. That is my definition of high probability. I get the question all the time, like what makes a trade high probability? The fact that you can only really define it either in a bullish stance or a bearish stance. And using the concepts that I teach, it is impossible to sell it to yourself as a opposing opportunity. In other words, if you're bullish, if you think the market's going to go up, can you go in in any way, shape or form, justify a short using what I'm teaching you? And if that's true, you can find something that's short. That's not high. It doesn't mean that it can't still go up. It just means that it's not high probability. So when I'm mentoring my students, I'm teaching them to look for those types of setups. And the whole point of yesterday was not a high probability setup. And I told you, watch, they're going to build this up, take the buy side out and watch the middle of the range. And it's going to occur between three o'clock and four o'clock. I don't know why these beta males out there that want to sit here on the sidelines when it's safe and not show you anything that they're doing this year, but they want to talk and chit chat. Go into the whole timeline of yesterday and the real riders that were with me the entire day yesterday. Yes, it was grueling. Yes, I beat your Twitter up. <laughs> okay. But you came away with now a, a measure of experience that you otherwise not well, would have never, never had got without having gone through it. It's easy to get frustrated and say, you know, what? I'm not this anymore. I'm done. Or go in there and over trade and not knowing what you're doing and then walk away with a toxic view about the experience. Whereas yesterday, all of us that were together, we were walking through the entire daily range on a one minute chart. So that way we are reading the intraday volatility, how the market would likely reach for a liquidity pool. If it doesn't reach down for it, what's it going to do? Change gears. If it pulls back into a imbalance after it's left it, I taught you how to save your stop. Don't wait for a full stop out. Like there was a lot of things yesterday that if I were 20 years old again, I would have really had a notebook out and pen and literally going through that whole thing again and with the chart like i would still be doing it today going back through yesterday's price action reading everything into what i was outlining on the tweets because that would have preserved counts that i literally with live money blew out in the early 20 uh, not early 20 or in the early 20s and in the early 1990s so when i give you these lectures and i talk about you know the things that are going to be problematic they're conversations that the young guys want. Like, you don't want that. You want to be in these big moves that capture a lot of movement, make money, and then parade on social media. That's not what I'm trying to inspire. I'm, in I'm trying to inspire folks that have a sober mindset about the real risks involved in this industry because it's easy to hurt yourself. It's easy to hurt yourself listening to anybody, even myself. So I have to pick my words carefully because there's a few out there that just want to take anything they can take out of context and say, look, he didn't do this right. He said that he didn't. But forgetting the fact that we about three o'clock yesterday being a short after the buy stops get taken out and go back to the middle of the range. They're not going to talk about that. But that was the whole point of yesterday's discussion. So. As I mentor, as I teach, as I try to bring things to light with, you know, the things that I use and implement in the marketplace there's this large chasm okay between hearing me or watching me display an idea conceptually versus really understanding what it is that is required to do it yourself because the analogy i use all the time it's not like you watch the video and it's an instant download it may feel like that. It may look like it's easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. When you're developing and you're learning, it's normal for you to have that overwhelming sense of uncertainty. That's, that's a normal thing. And I had that. I had that for a long time. 
nobody was really cheering me on. I'm telling you that that's a normal part of this process and try not to get your attention on like the Instagram guys that want to promote the image only that type of thing. I want all of you, at least in my target audience is I want everyone to appreciate the underlying risks because it's real easy to wreck yourself financially, emotionally, psychologically, and it's painful and you can develop real mental illness from allowing yourself to be harmed in these marketplaces because it's easy to just feel like, okay, well, I got time. I'm going to sit down in front of the charts. And if you applied that type of mindset yesterday, that was the whole point of walking you through it yesterday. I knew if I wouldn't have been talking or tweeting about yesterday, most of you would have been like, I'm done. They're just not doing anything. I'm bored. Some people were actually tweeting. Say, oh, there's no setup. I'm just going to leave. If you are not versed in understanding what you're doing in the market, number one, two, with what I'm teaching you, and you say, I'm not going to look at the market because the setup's not there. You're cheating yourself from real experience that's going to protect you in the future. I'm not always going to be here to point to where the market's going to go. I'm not going to be chit-chatting with my mentorship group You know, in the future when I can't do it. They're going to be left to make these decisions and lean on their own experience. So when I teach, I'm teaching an independent thinker's approach where you're not handheld with me. I'm not trying to glad hand with anybody. I'm not holding anybody hostage. My intent is for you to be able to look at the things I'm teaching you, go through the experiences and endure the things that are required for you to get a better understanding of what it is that's required to participate in these markets. But the importance is, is you have to go through these long periods of boring boring price action and looking at things that aren't necessarily going to put anything in your pocket immediately or take anything out. That's the main plus. That's an advantage. So when you're just observing and you're tape reading, not even demo trading, like there's a lot of you that are pushing the button already with live accounts saying, yeah, I made this ICT. I did this with your mentorship. That's cool. You know, I get it. You're excited, but I've already mentioned many times, none of you should be doing that yet. Like we have not had enough time for me first starting teaching this whole thing. I think what was the first lesson in, in February or something to that effect? It was really early in the year. All of you should still be in the observation and maybe just starting to work into forward testing. But forward testing is not pressing a demo. Like you got to be sitting down in front of the market and tape read Make annotations on your chart without pushing a button. Stop thinking about how much money you're making or losing and stop thinking about all the opportunities that you're missing. Things repeat. That's some of the better takeaways from sitting down in front of the charts and reading price on a day-by-day -day basis because then you'll be convinced rather quickly that there's a, an ample amount of opportunities over the month. Stop thinking that you have to trade every single day. If you beat yourself up and not know what you're doing and you overtrade and or push, like I would like to see, I would like to see that 3855 level swept. It would make sense to do that. But the market can stay in a range bound condition or trade higher and leave that there. It could, it could be there for months. Nothing says it has to go down there right away. I prefer it. And right now, if you're looking at your, Let's see. On your E mini SP, let's go into a five minute chart. All right. So, right now it's 10 minutes to nine New York local time. We have swept in 34 level. And we took out the short term highs at 39.44. So, both near term buy side liquidity and sell side has been taken out. After three, on, again, we're looking at a five-minute chart on E-mini S&P. So in TradingView, your symbol would be ESM2022 and five minutes interval. So if you look at the high that was formed around five o'clock in the morning or so, let me see if that's the right time. You have 5.10, 5.15. That high at 39.49 and a half, that was 
three times the market went up. See that? It was a high formed at 3.45 a.m., then a higher high formed at 4.40 or so, and then 5.15. Then the market broke a short-term low at 5 o'clock in the morning. Fair value gap formed on the 5.40 candle, and then the market traded down. And notice it did not take out the short-term low at 4.10, but then ran up above the short-term high at 6.20. Again, then broke down. We created another fair value gap on the 810 candle. The displacement on the downside, except for that small little low at 8 o'clock on the dot. And then we broke down and took out the short term low at 710. Now, I'm not saying that you can't scalp that. That's obviously a scalp, but when I'm looking at the market, I'm not looking for these little tiny micro moves, okay? I'm looking for a move that could be framed as a small scalp like that, but I want to be part of a larger price run. I mentioned earlier in the conversation that I'm teaching my students to look for low resistance liquidity runs. That's either going long and running above an old high or going short, target of running out an old low. That is kind of like my bread and butter approach to trading. Um, there are things that obviously help me frame that logic and that idea, but they are predominantly already taught on my YouTube channel. So you can dig into all those other things that support the idea. But the main thing, if you're a student that just came to me by way of someone saying, hey, look, check this guy out, whatever. Um, note that low. At eight, I'm sorry, at 410, at the liquidity resting rate below there. There isn't really any imbalance to the left of us. So the liquidity resting below 410 on E mini SP, the five minute chart, that's a draw on liquidity. And then there's no real imbalance after that until we get down to the lows at uh, 250. Notice the low at uh, 250 in the morning. Uh, go back a little bit. And you'll see that's relative equal lows down there. So there's sell side resting below that. So that's a draw. Let me put that on a chart now. All right. So I forgot what I was saying. Um, low resistance liquidity run. The idea of looking for trades that are one sided, where it's easy, you don't have to put a whole lot of thought into it, but waiting for those types of setups. Those are, in my opinion, what traders should be striving to trade and hunt, not looking for just any old pattern. You know, you're all learning my fair value gap. Not every little gap constitutes a low resistance liquidity run entry. Many times it could be just filling it in. It's because it's a common gap. Fair value, fair value gaps are part of a underlying logic. And it's not just a small little separation that's highlighted with three candles, okay? That candle at, if you have your five minute chart up on EMA S&P, if you look at the, the candle exactly at 810 this morning on May 20th, 2022, that is the fair value gap. That one candle that is down, the next candle to the right of it has a high of 39, 40 and a half. The candle prior to the candle at 810 has a low of 39, 41 and a half. That gap, because it has already ran buy stops, the buy stops resting above that 620 high, that right there, that is a fair value gap because it's implying, and the logic behind this and narrative is the market has already dropped. And we return back into that imbalance at 810, that candle. So it fills in that candle, rebalances, it goes back up to the low of the candle at 805. Then prices allow the release lower and take out the low at 710 because there's liquidity resting below that. And then now we just swept the low, or did we? Did we get that yet? Yep, we swept the low at. 
410. So when I'm teaching people to look at the marketplace, it's easy for someone to be critical and um, say, okay, look at this, you know, this fair value gap didn't work there. Oh, this, this didn't work there. This didn't work there. When, if you're going to look at what I'm teaching or investigate what it is I'm looking for, don't go in with the mindset saying, let's see how this fails. I want you to go in looking at how I teach you how to find it because the critics, they avoid all that. They're not going to go through the process of doing it the right way as I outline it. And then you'll see that they're, they exist. They're there in the move every single day, every single week, they repeat all the time. If you go in looking for moves, that's just simply because you think it's a fair value gap. That's going to frustrate you because it's not going to give you moves like yesterday. There may be fair value gaps there, okay, by what is defined as the pattern. But that pattern is not associated with the expected delivery of price for that given day. So what do I mean by that? As I outlined one day on Thursday, it was a large range day. And we're near the end of the range on that daily run, it was lower from April high to May 12th. So we're, by definition, without the use of an indicator, we're oversold. We don't need an indicator to plot the fact that we're oversold. So the market's really, really, really suppressed, pulled down low. It's at a real deep discount. And we're at the end of the week. And we stopped short on S&P and the NASDAQ before running out May 12th low. The Dow was able to go through May 12th slow. So all of those ingredients come together and create this product called consolidation. And those days, if you don't know what you're looking for, when to anticipate them, how to read them, you can go in and trick yourself into thinking there's a pattern there. There's a pattern in anything. You can be fooled by randomness. But when you apply logic and the narrative that would be associated with a low resistance liquidity run, that means it's a high probability one-sided price move that is justifiable only on the side that you're trying to trade. In the beginning, when you're learning, it's not going to feel clear to you as to what that means. And that's why I tell everyone, you have to take your time. You're going to get these moments of astonishment where it's like... I, I finally got that. It's an epiphany where you discover what you didn't realize was important to you. Now, suddenly things become a lot, a lot more clear. And that is the byproduct of going through back testing, looking through old data and studying it. Watch that gap at, let's see, what candle is that? 840 on your five minute chart. See if there's any response after going into the high on the 845 candles high at 39, 37 and a quarter. See if there's a response in there. We left relative equal lows at 29 and a quarter. And we have sell side resting just below 39.15 and a quarter. So one of the frustrating things I've in, endured as a mentor and teacher, not just in recent years, but when I was doing one-on-one -on -one consultations and, and teaching one-on-one -on -one back in the late 90s, that does not happen. So please don't try to reach out to me. I don't do them anymore, but I'm just referring back to those experiences. I had many times where the people I was working with, they would take what I gave them follow the instructions, and they were on their way, happy. And I had a handful of folks that were, if I give them a set of rules and say, this is what you're looking for, this is what you're trying to operate and engage with, they would say, okay, um, I, I get what you're saying, but. So as soon as you say but, you just cancel out everything before what you just said. What they were saying to me and showcasing is, is they have no discipline. And many of you learning this, not just under me, many of you are going to discover that you don't have discipline either. I didn't have it either in the beginning. I was 
literally all over the place chasing everything because I felt like there was going to be something else that made it easier. When I discovered the easy aspect comes through the grueling process of going through and reading price, studying this candlesticks, not it wasn't candlesticks back then, it was behind a closed bar. But the the randomness of price action, what repeating phenomenon were taking place and studying that. And because I was actually taking trades and losing, I was trying to go back and say, okay, somebody obviously made money on the other side of this trade. So how are they doing that? If I'm losing in my live account and I'm putting money up and I'm buying grain markets or I'm buying you know, live cattle or lean hogs or you know, crude oil, gold or whatever I was at the time trading, what was I doing wrong that they could see that was an opportunity? And that was one of the biggest epiphanies for me is to go back and see what it was I was referring to and how if I was to reverse it and say, okay, if I didn't look at it with that perspective in mind, okay, if I didn't look at it as um, if, I'm, if I'm bullish, I'm, I'm buying it. That's all, that's all I was doing back in the 90s. I was afraid to short. I didn't understand it. So I was a perma bull. Okay. So if I took a long and I got stopped out, or if I didn't use a stop loss, because I did that a lot in the 90s, I was afraid to put it in the wrong place. So what was the safest way to trade then in my mind? Don't use a stop. And I ruined myself so many times doing that. You have to have a, a threshold at which this is where I'm wrong. I'm not going to trade anymore. This is where I have to pull the plug. But I would go back in my trades and start reverse engineering it from the other side like someone was a bear and that was one of the biggest discoveries for me to trust being a short or a bear is to see when my own live trades were failing when i was extremely bullish and i had the, my biggest positions on i'm long 20 contracts of soybeans you know i'm i'm really in there i'm really trying to do what is likely to be a big move right so if it craps out and I'm stopped out and it goes careening the other direction. I'm going in trying to figure out what it is that I did wrong. And if I was a bearish trader, what was I looking for that would be there? And one of the patterns that kept continuously forming is what I literally just gave you all on mentorship on YouTube. That pattern of waiting for a run higher because I would chase breakouts. I didn't call myself a breakout artist. Okay, because breakout artists, they would literally just leave their their stop order above the marketplace and let the market in. Not me. Back then, I was scared. I was scared. I wanted to see the market really running, really taking off, where a reasonable expectation would be to see the market go maybe two cents above an old high. If you're trading the grains, it's like $100 per contract. It's like it's the same as like an e-mini. It's $50 per uh, cent. But I would wait for it to move like, 15 to 20 cents. Now, on that big candle up, I'd be chasing it and buying long there. Well, obviously, just static retracements would come back and start scaring me. And I would move my top loss, if I had one, lower, opening up the risk even larger and larger. Because in my mind, I had to be right because it's been going up. It was really explosive to the upside. But I got wrecked. <laughs> I got my hinder parts handed to me. And what I discovered was this pattern of going above an old high, then breaking down, and then that secondary rally up. At that time, if I hadn't been stopped out or if I removed my stop and I weathered that retracement, I would feel like, okay, <sighs> I dodged the bullet there. And then I would feel more confident and i'd be in there praying to god help me get this move past you know this level here keep going up you know just let me get out of it even at that point i didn't want to be a profitable trader in that trade i just wanted to be able to survive it in the commission which at that paying 100 dollars per contract let me say it again 100 dollars every contract Fox Investments, <laughs> okay? That's what I was paying as a beginning trader. Everybody was getting raped back then. It was ridiculous. Okay, you guys 
complain about what you have to pay for your commissions today. This is peanuts, okay? It's nothing compared to what we were having to pay back in the 90s and before that. It was just, you know, they called it full service brokerage. Full service. <laughs> yeah, they're servicing you, right? The hose without no lube. And I didn't know any better. I figured this is what you're supposed to do. And it wasn't until later on I moved to Linda Waldock where it was a little bit better in terms of the commissions. I think it was around like $30 round turn, which even by today's standards is still, but man, coming from a hundred dollars per contract to $30, it's, you know, it's a big savings. But back to the discussion about how this whole model evolved during that return back to the fair value gap that I had no awareness of. I had no awareness of that fair value gap at all. Didn't even stand out in the chart. I had no idea what it was. Didn't see it. It was always in the charts, but I paid no attention to it because I didn't understand it. But as it went back up into that fair value gap, I'm thinking, okay, my long trade is going to be able to get me back to a point where I can just get out of it because I can't stand it. I'm completely, I'm completely mentally and physically and emotionally fatigued now. I don't have any stamina to be in the market anymore. Not long, not short, nothing. I just want to be out of it. Give me a number one, you know, tweet to me, number one right now, if you've ever had that experience where you're in a trade and you're just absolutely exhausted. You just want to get back to even. You don't care about being profitable. You don't want to be a, you know, a net loss on the trade, but you just, I don't even care if it goes to the moon. Just let me get out of where I got in it. That is what these markets will do to you. That is the byproduct of a day like yesterday. You have to know what that feels like. And many of you are so new, absolutely so new, that you don't even know that that's available to you in terms of insight and experience that would protect you. It keeps you from learning how painful <laughs> that you can blow your account. You don't need to blow your account, folks, to, to learn these lessons. That's why I'm mentoring you this way. If you go through these learning episodes and, and take yourself in the market and endure these moments like yesterday, that one day you can look back and say, well, this, I didn't make any money. This was a waste of my time. This is a joke. This guy can't trade. His fair value gap pattern didn't work. His model's broken. It's fake. It's a flaw. It's a lot. It's illogical. You know, he's only hindsight. He's this, he's that. That's what losing traders do. You immediately go to the toxic excuse as to why it's not working for you. When the whole concept and the point was go into the marketplace, study, what is it doing? How is this going to benefit me? Or more importantly, how could I be harmed by this? Because if these environments repeat, they do. If you know what they look like going in, or once you get involved and you can identify what it is in terms of a market profile day where it's likely to consolidate and, and chop you up, how do you engage with that? How do you trade it? Well, I gave you insights yesterday on how to do that. Stop trading off until all throughout the afternoon, wait to that last hour of trading. And look for a pattern that makes sense. That run my buy stops and pull back to the middle of the range. You don't need it to take out the, the lows at 39 or 38.55 or what it was. You don't need that. If it pulls back to the middle of the range and you sold short the daily high, who's going to complain about that? I'm sure look around, you'll find somebody. <laughs> but if you're in here trying to find setups that are consistent, even on consolidation days, you're going to find that those choppy days, if you go back and look at the last hour of trading, many times you're going to find that opportunity present itself. And sometimes it can go even further in the middle of the range. But it's better to take the bulk of your trade off, as you watched me illustrate in my video last night. It's better to take the bulk of your trade off in the middle because it could stay range bound or like it did with me, come back up and take my stop, which was only on one contract basis. And the majority of everything else was taken off in the middle of range. And you watched me take the other one off, but remaining two, I took one off in the video of the recording. But back to the discussion of the model. So during my times when I was being a breakout trader chasing price, so I'm, I'm like Johnny come lately. Okay, I'm, I'm waiting for it to not only break out bullishly and run up 15, 20 pennies. Okay, that's $1,500. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's 20 cents. That's $1,000. So $750 to $1,000 movement already higher. 
and then I'm going in and I'm buying it. That's what I was doing back then. Because in my mind, as a new trader, no experience whatsoever, completely greenhorn. <laughs> I mean, I was the definition of absolutely clueless, but I'm in there with live money. Way too fast, no idea what I was doing. And I was chasing it because I was thinking, okay, Ken Roberts showed me in this book that these moves go like $20 moves, you know, in, in the grains. You can do that. Or silver is going to go up to $50, you know, an ounce. It's every day, every year he was promoting that. Buy silver, buy silver, buy silver. And that book really converted me into thinking that every trade I was going to get into was going to be these big blowout, huge run-up moves. So it was in my mind thinking, hey, I'm going to wait for it to break out. That initial breakout encourages me, but then I'm going to wait. I want to have further confirmation. And a lot of you actually probably have this experience too, where you can pretty much see likely to go, but you don't have the courage to actually go in when it's the best time to get in. You want to wait for it to start moving in that direction and give up a half or three quarters of the move. And then you start saying, okay, well, I can see it's going to go to that particular level right there. And then you go into the trade and it might go for you a little piece. And those are your wins. They're the ones that you'll feel confident in showing your friends on social media or your coworkers, but you won't share the ones where it retraces against you, which is normal, but you get either stopped out or scared and you close the trade and then it runs to your objective. And you go away thinking, oh, I'm never gonna learn this. You're never gonna learn it doing it that way. And just like I didn't learn how to trade profitably by doing what I was explaining earlier, waiting for the, anticipating the breakout, seeing it, and then watching it run even further and then calling that confirmation. No. That's not confirmation. That is observation of someone else doing it right and me not having the understanding, the discipline, or the foresight as gauge it when I should have. But when it would go back up into that fair value gap on my long, after it took out a high, I would be confident that I'm going to get to the point where I can get out of the trade and be break even. So what I was doing was teaching myself to be what? Late to the party and never making money. Think about that. Apply that same hardcore in the mirror analysis of yourself. Because I guarantee you, put a number two, tweet to me number two, if you've ever endured that or experienced it. And there's no shame in it. It's normal because these markets are a... Well, in a lot of ways, it's a mirror. It's going to show you yourself. And that reflection isn't going to be appreciated by most of you. Because you think you, you look a certain way or are a certain type of person. And when you engage in these marketplaces and you put in your opinion or you associate your intellect to what these little patterns and candlesticks are likely to do next. And young men and women, they stake their whole existence and image on the fact that these candlesticks do something that relates to a profitable or um, positive outcome. Instead of just saying, okay, is this making me money? And how is it going to hurt me? And over time, when I was going back through all of my losing trades as a, as a bull, because in the 90s, that's all I was doing, I discovered because that pattern that uh, Ken Roberts was teaching in his um, course, which was <laughs> not really accurately described or titled, but the world's most powerful money manual in course. And it was neither powerful okay, or enabling for me for any profitability. I, I've never made money with anything the guy taught. But when I took everything that he talked about and John Murphy refers to in his book, Technical Analysis of the Financial Markets. I think that is a book that everybody should have, not because the stuff in it works, but because if you take that logic and turn it upside down, you have a 90% winning rate Okay, in backtesting. Go back and look at all that kind of stuff. And that logic fails. It fails. Trend lines are wonderful when it's already happened. Everybody can do that kind of, kind of thing. But the hard walk forward for traders, not only under my mentorship, but in any 
endeavor in terms of trading. This is hard, not because the concepts are you know unavailable because they have been obviously explained to you. What makes it hard is, is your personal personality, uh, your character flaws. All of us have character flaws. I'm a perfectionist. I have to be perfect. Like I have to be perfect. And my that's what I'm pursuing. Never going to get there. But my trades, the the things I'm showing, I think they they illustrate above average. I'm getting into lows and getting out above old highs, vice versa. Now, I'm not doing it all the time. I take losing trades. Logic is, is I want to go in and I try to teach my students, where is the most logical entry point for a trade? And be that, I want to know where is it likely to go and if that is likely to be the outcome or the terminus where price is going to be drawn to. Can I justify a trade in the, oppo uh, the opposing direction? Because if I can do that, then I still might take the trade, but I'm not going to trade with 4.5% leverage behind it, which would be like my competitive leverage gearing. I don't always trade with that, but I do it to showcase the difference between talkers out there that talk about what they do in market replay and day in reports that they can easily be you know, changed and audited and make adjustments and edit it. You can't do that with trading view. There's nothing you can't do any of that with trading view. And you sure as hell aren't going to be able to do that when you're trading through a live broker and using trading view as the portal. So that's why I'm teaching the way I teach. That's why I'm in this trading view. That's why I show you the statements. That's why I show you the results. The bottom line is, is you can go out there and chase all kinds of wonderful illusions that a lot of people want to trick you into believing. And yes, I made millions of dollars selling my education. I don't do that right now. I'm not going to do it again. This is not a lead in. I'm not teaching you a little bit to get your, your mouth wet and then say, okay, now here's the, here's the pitch. I'm not selling anything, nothing. It's been stressful, but I do enjoy teaching. But I want to teach you properly because there's a way to do this incorrectly. And it's everybody out there parroting what I say. They have no idea why I said what I said. They just repeat what I said. And that's why their students get frustrated because they can't get answers to the things that they heard me say they, then then repeat because they don't understand why I said what I said. So when I do these long rants and discussions that are very boring to someone that just wants to get in, give me a stop and give me a target. I ain't got time for this. I got things to go on you know, and talk about. Those individuals are never going to find longevity or consistency. And my students, my heart is in them succeeding. And I think if you pay attention to me long enough, you can hear that. Like I am passionate about all of you. Like I want you to succeed. What's it going to give me? There isn't going to be a mentorship for sale. It's just the enjoyment, the satisfaction of knowing that I poured myself into individuals on the internet that I'm never likely to meet. And you have done something to change your entire family tree. And that to me is amazing. I wish I would have found somebody like what I'm trying to be for all of you. But I'm not going to sugarcoat this stuff for you. I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say, you're going to walk into these marketplaces and it's going to be an optimal trade entry every single time you get in it. And you don't need to worry about a stop loss. You don't need to worry about over leveraging. Just do as much as you can afford. Do you understand how irresponsible that would be? I'm telling you, I'm promising you that you're going to lose money. These young guys out there that sell courses and make YouTube videos, you never hear them talk about risk. None of them really put risk disclaimers in front of their videos, but they're out there showing their leased Lamborghinis and such. Let me tell you something. When you make, for instance, like $500,000 a week in mentorship pay, okay, how many Lamborghinis could I have purchased or even leased doing that for six years or so? How many houses could I have rented and pretended to be somebody I'm not? How many vacations could I went on 
took pictures and had somebody go around taking pictures of me and filming me. Look at me, I'm flossing. If that was what I wanted to do, I certainly could have done so. And you didn't see it, still don't see it. Because none of that is going to deposit money into your pocket. A lot of you are trying to live vicariously through other guys and gals out there on the internet doing those types of things. When I was a younger man, that was my approach. Today, I teach with a really boring, introverted style because this is what pays the bills. This is what's realistic about managing risk. Talking about making money and not really emphasizing the underlying risk associated to doing this is irresponsible. And I want you to understand where you're going to lose. I I'm telling you, you're going to lose, but I want you to know that it's assuring to know where these pitfalls are likely to materialize. Some people are not going to want to find value in that. Like yesterday's entire drawn out discussion throughout the day. That is a day that will absolutely you down. Anybody that's talking smack, I guarantee you, ask them to show their trade statements from yesterday. Live trade statements. Anybody wants to talk smack, go show it. Put it up on YouTube, put it on Twitter. I guarantee you they won't do that because they probably got chopped up yesterday. I'm sitting here trying the, the best I can possibly be to be a, a an insightful educator and dad to him and also communicate the same things to you typing it out <laughs> throughout the entire day and he's able to push the button and he's doing well he's not been learning how to trade very long and we're talking literally less than a month so he is by no means a trading giant he's not that great yet there's a lot of things he's uncertain about. He's not confident about himself at this point, but his in intentions, he says, is that once he understands what he's doing, he wants to put a YouTube channel together. And should he get to this point, I will absolutely invite all of you over there. He doesn't care about trolls. He's not trying to teach anybody. He just wants to have the opportunity to say, this is what I apply with my dad's life's work. And this is what I took myself out of my job with. Because I make my kids work menial jobs. You probably work menial jobs. I did a lot of them. If you look at my younger life, I had such low income jobs that just stripped time from me. And I hated it. And I hated every person that employed me. Not because they were bad people. I, I did have bad employers. But I hated them because they had control over me, my time. When can I do something? When can't I do something? And what am I getting paid for being here? You're prostituting my time for next to nothing. And I have nothing to show for it. So that lesson was important for me. And I forced that on my children. You see these trolls out there. One guy that says he uh, invested 20 hours into private investigators. Ask him what about the chargeback he did for his private investigator because he couldn't afford the $10,000 for the 10 days that they were recording me. And then uh, he asked them to go on my personal property, record through my windows, my family and wife and children through my windows. And then they fired him. And then he did a charge back on his credit card saying, oh, yeah, I didn't make these charges. For yeah, we know about that. These people, OK, they're sick. They're not teaching you anything that makes money. They don't make money for real. They're working in market replay because if they could, they'd be taking their AMP account right over that trading view and plug it in. And then you'd see the results like I just showed my son yesterday. Hello. Shit just got real. My daughter does not work at no fucking Chipotle. She managed every store. My children are being groomed to appreciate the money they make. On their own steam. I can give them millions. But what have I done? If I die, they can't make more of it. So I'm giving them a life skill. And I'm hardening them. 
I had a rough childhood. I appreciate the things I've been given and, and blessed with. And this insight was not easy coming to me. I went through a lot of hardship. My children will appreciate what they can do on their own. Because if I give it to them, it's just like any old Christmas present you give to your, your children. Oh, it's great for that moment when they tear it open. And 20 minutes later, they've done forgot about it. The appreciation has evaporated. A life skill like this, well, guess what? It continuously gives over and over and over again. And that would make me proud to see. I hope I get to see all of my children. I'm hoping that when Caleb makes this turning point where he can be consistent, not have any inspiration by me whatsoever, to do this on his own. Two more minutes and the equities open up. <clears throat> that I can shine. I want to see that. Like it's emotional for me to to see it finally one of my kids are, are trying to do it. it admittedly they are all waiting for me just to hand them money i guess like anybody else's parents when they're with someone that's affluent i don't live my life affluently you've obviously seen part of that i live an introverted life i try not to draw too much attention to myself and hopefully my children follow that same process but my children work menial jobs caleb right now brings home four hundred dollars a week at his job comes home sore works in a warehouse making i don't know if it's condiments or something like not ketchup or anything like that but some like uh the name escapes me horseradish his company makes horseradish they're, made, they're known for making horseradish <clears throat> and my other son cody he lives across the street from his stepfather and they have a trailer that he lives in by choice he's traded crypto but he and i you know we're not the closest but i hope that when he sees caleb do well it'll inspire him to do the same thing but they're all individual people living their their individual lives and they're making whatever decisions they're making on their own and the consequences that come from those decisions we're about to open up here in about 15 seconds those decisions are going to bring with them the rewards or repercussions and all of them have been made available like all the things that i know how to do are made available to them but you're discovering that it's not easy is it it takes some work and they're young they're in their 20s they they're not thinking they you know i want to pour all that time into that that's just going to be worn down to money that's really what they're thinking like 20 year olds do um, just take a second here. I'm watching this opening price movement here. One more run on the 39, 29, 50 level. Not too exciting this morning so far. Watch the buy side at uh, 3950. I'm looking at still the five minute chart because there's nothing for me to be looking at any lower. Now we opened, we went down below the 39.30 lows just briefly and just a small little movement above the high formed at 8.35. So 
so far we don't have anything to work on based on bias. I think that it would make sense for them to run the buy side in here because everybody wants that 3855 level. Everybody's pointing to it. Everybody, even people that are on Twitter, they're looking for it too. So if I was making a market, I'd run it up the 3950s. NASDAQ is real heavy in here. NASDAQ has got stops at uh, 11,960. S&P should be picking up, moving lower now if it's going to move in concert with uh, NASDAQ. Dow, you can see it's sloppy, and that's the reason why I don't touch it. S&P is refusing to go lower. Um. All right, so now think about what I was talking about earlier how we have this expectation of hunting one-sidedness in the marketplace. Does the market show a one-sidedness this morning? No. Even in the opening, it's been not in a hurry to get anywhere in particular. It's just recently went above and below for near-term liquidity, and it hasn't really moved a lot yet. Now, admittedly, it's only been four minutes, not even four minutes since the opening, but NAS looks like it wants to take its 11,960, 11,950 liquidity. No real imbalance on S&P to speak of. The only thing in my mind is the buy side at 4,950, but the stops below. 39.15 and a quarter. Did they take it down to 39.15 to make them think they're going to run for the 38.55 and then ram it up into 39.50? That would be what I, <laughs> I would do that. I would absolutely do that. NASDAQ in striking distance on that 11,950. Yeah, SP just not wanting to join the fund. Now, in response to what I was saying earlier about one-sidedness, when you have a one-sided market gearing where a low resistance liquidity run for like a run to an old high or an old low, which is what I'm kind of really trying to teach my store, it'll have a very clear pattern and expectation at the opening price or at the opening, at the opening at 930, you'll get this flurry of price action. Like if we were bearish, the ideal scenario in my mind would have been run up, take the uh, take out the 39.50 level and then break down, then come back in for a fair value gap and then run for 39.15 and a quarter. That's if I was bearish, that would be the ideal scenario I would have been looking for. And we didn't get that. We get a fair value gap form at this is the S&P five minute chart so that you can calibrate on your end. Uh, 840, that candle is a fair value gap. Uh, it returned back up into that area, and I mentioned that you know watch that level, and we've now started moving lower. S I'm sorry, Nasdaq has blown out its eleven thousand nine fifty level. S and P is about to take that thirty nine fifteen and a quarter level, and Dow just looks like a mess. So, I, like I said, I don't trade Dow. It's only thirty 
stocks that make up that composite index. And those 30 stocks just don't have as much weight that like the S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100 have. <laughs> but yeah, we want to see one side in this when we're looking at the marketplace. And if you don't have clear one side in this, and then if you're expecting bearish prices, the obvious would be the market rallies above the opening price runs to either an old high or rebounds to a fair value gap, then breaks down and goes to a low resistance liquidity run for sell side liquidity below old low. That is to me what all of you should be hunting for. That's your unicorn. Okay. They exist. They're in the marketplace, but they don't form every single trading session every single day. You'll have a handful of those over the course of a week. But apart from that, you can do little tiny little scalps. They may not have the same level of probability behind them, but if you're getting one for one and you know what you're doing, you're not over leveraging yourself. You can grow an account with one to one. You don't need five to one, 50 to one, 200 to one, like these guys on Instagram and, and <laughs> Telegram rooms. Yeah, I'm doing. If you ever done the math on these guys, they're old, okay, but they're claiming they got 500 to one trades. Why aren't they billionaires? Like, seriously, why, if you can do that, why are you trading with one micro lot with your MT4 screenshots? Like, it's been six months. You should be at least above a standard lot now. The things that people believe and swallow just because they see one screenshot of something is ridiculous. And all I try to do is be a voice of reason, okay? I could do a lot of those things for real that they're pretending to afford, but it does nothing to make you a better trader. Thinking about things responsibly, respecting the level of risk, and doing things that are boring. Trading is boring. You want it to be boring. Your job sucks, right? Everybody hates their job. You're there. You have to put in the time. It's boring. You'd rather be doing something else. Trading is like that too. People say, oh, I love trading. No, you don't. You don't love trading. You love trading when it's profitable. <laughs> okay, let's be real. You don't like trading. You don't love trading. You love winning. Okay, but everybody wants to love trading. I eat, sleep, breathe trading. Yeah, I do those things and I hate it. Like I hate it. I love backtesting. I love studying price action. I love that. I hate trading. Why do I hate trading? Because Every single one of these candles that form, I'm expecting it to do what I want it to do. Think about that now. I'm being 100% honest with you. I want every single one of these candles to do exactly what I want them to do. And that is an internal struggle for me because I have mentioned many times I'm obsessively compulsive. So I want things my way. I am an absolute control freak on every aspect of my, and when I look at these candlesticks, it's an internal arm wrestling match when they don't bend to my will. So in my approach to learning how to beat these markets, I had to align myself with how they book. And I was blessed and fortunate to end up in the situations that I was in that I was able to learn what these things do. There are times when I don't know what they're doing. And it was a hard process for me to learn when that is because when you're young and you're able to do very, very well, very, very easily after initial luck, it gives you this feeling of invincibility. You feel like you can't do anything wrong. You feel like you can just walk in there and command the attention of everybody. And it messes with you. So that sense of arrogance and pride that was an affliction for me as a young man. That obviously is what goes on with students. They learn from me, they get good at it, and then they console themselves with pompous actions, okay? And they outwardly, you know, flex. And if you're young and you're doing that kind of stuff, just know that that did not help me. It hurt me. And in a world like today, like I would 
really be popular. If I was the old me in 20s on Instagram, I'd probably be one of the biggest followed persons on Instagram in, in the trading circles. Watch the uh, the 3950 levels on S&P. No imbalance on uh, spoos on the downside. It just ran down, didn't get into the 39.15 and a quarter level, but we're back above uh, where we opened. Real, real choppy. Indecisive price actions, what I'm saying. But uh, um, the last thing I want you all to do, if you're young and you're trying to learn this, is go out and try to outwardly express yourself in a pompous manner because it's you're not your only thing you're going to do is attract the wrong element the people that are just going to look for you to be how are you going to outshine the last time you did on instagram how are you going to outdo the last video you just did where you showed your house that you're renting or the last cars that you bought but they're not showing trades you're not showing how to go in and help the viewer and i'm trying to do that even in these boring discussions that i have in my videos i'm giving you those mile markers that you're going to encounter given enough time you're going to endure these things and if you don't have something to lean on in terms of correcting the direction you're in or encouraging you to, to make a change or endure something it's unfortunate that you know People think that that part of the video or that part of my teaching is the least of importance. And you actually see people go in and put little minute marker links to avoid, in my opinion, the real important factors in those videos. It's not me pushing a button, watching the chart go to a specific level. That's entertaining for you as a new student because it's like, oh, wow, I see that works. That's cool. But the things I'm talking about in the video that everybody else would just kind of like dismiss. That's the thing that gave me the foresight and trust to stay in the trade. How many times have you taken scared because it didn't move right away for you? Why does that happen? Because you haven't endured enough back testing and then tape reading, getting comfortable with the idea of what it is you're looking for. What's the pattern? What's the framework? Is it repeating? And then once you identify and you grow confident that it repeats, to some of you are saying, oh, yeah, it repeats. So ICT says it repeats. Do you know it repeats personally? Have you done the work? Don't take what I say and run around thinking that's the gospel. I'm telling you, go out there and prove it to yourself because once that, nobody's going to convince you. And that's why people say it's like a cult here. If this is a cult, you're welcome to leave. <laughs> okay, nobody's holding you here. There's no Kool-Aid, you know, exit strategy here. You're all welcome to, to stop watching me or stop listening to me. But if you want to learn how I'm doing it, I'm literally giving you everything. I'm, tell I'm telling you what goes on in my mind, what the hurdles that you're going to encounter and how to overcome them. If you choose not to listen to it, don't be upset when you don't get the results you're looking for. So it's 945. I'm just looking at NASDAQ right here. And Dow's come back up uh, into its opening range. The S&P was unable to take that 39.15 and a quarter low out. NASDAQ did. So again, we have a divergence at the lows on S&P against the NASDAQ. NASDAQ went lower. S&P failed to go lower. And um, what I'm to specifically, if you look at the candle at 9.35, the S&P failed to make that lower low than that of 2.50. So 2.50 is low on S&P has been kept in place, but the 3 o'clock in the morning low on NASDAQ has been swept out. Yeah, I would not be, uh, I didn't, 
not interested in today. No news. It's a Friday. Most of the range for the week has been put in on Thursday. And everybody wants 38.55. So everybody, let's let's talk like um, retail for a second, okay? Let's say you were fortunate enough to be short from Tuesday or Monday or earlier in the week. Or, no, I'm sorry, Thursday. Say you were lucky enough to get the high on, on Thursday and wrote it down. It's Friday. What do you want to do going into the weekend? You want to get paid, right? So that's squaring of positions. If you don't want to think about the logic that I teach, okay, this is say it's retail logic. Would you reasonably assume and expect that short covering should come into the market today? Because to get out of their short, they got to do what? They're going to buy it, right? So if the market fails to go lower and you believe it's buying pressure that moves price up, I'll talk in those terms. That way you can understand what I see in price today. So that way I'll talk to you with retail logic. So that way, if you don't want to subscribe to the conspiracy ideas <laughs> that I get labeled with, we'll just call it. It's probably going to be short covering today. It probably won't go lower and disrupt those people that want to see that 3855 because everybody, everybody wants it. It's already talked about on every medium there is. So if it doesn't go down there and people are covering short, what is likely to be taken? Buy stops. Okay. So um, I'm not trading today. I'm not entering. I don't even have a trade entry forming in my charts right now. It's just sloppy opening range trading. But that 39.50 level just looks like it's just too easy. Like they can, man, they could take that and two candles and go on. So I'm not interested in taking anything today. Um, I have lots of video work to still complete with my other group. So I have uh, things I'm going to take care of today. But I, I really appreciate you hanging out with me this morning. And I'm not sure if it was in insightful to you, if it was helpful to you. Um, but I meant to yesterday with my son being here, I wasn't able to test my live streaming, but I got to tech you know, check that out and see if I can do that. So I'll probably end up doing that really late tonight. So if I wake you up or if I disturb you in your evening affairs, that it's not me trying to be on live sessions for a long period of time. I'm only going to go in there long enough to just test that I can see my screen and that I can hear myself. And should that work Monday, my intentions are to sit down that I don't want to be doing this because this to me is, it's, it's not, Sorry, I'm looking at price. It's not something I want to do. Like I, I feel disconnected because I'm. I got a phone facing me in my face, and then I got my charts in front of me. I feel like I'm plate spinning. So it would be just easier for me to have my chart in front of me and point to it. And but I wanted to give you the exercise of yesterday, sitting in there and <clears throat> internalizing the struggles that would be associated with a day like yesterday. But I think that's going to be it. And we will close our session now. I think if I do this right, a uh, little, the little toggle box I did for the um, Twitter space, it says toggle to record it. If all of you that know how to do this would help, I'm going to ask you a question and just reply to or send me a, a tweet to my roast. Uh, most recent, rather. Hang on a second. Yeah. Reply to my tweet, most recent one, and tell me how I make sure everybody can hear this. Because <laughs> I don't know how to do it. I know if, I'm, I know when I'm closing it, when I stop this, will everybody be able to see it or access it? I don't know. for someone to tell me exactly how to make sure everybody gets it. Beck, thank you very much for that. They're telling me it automatically saves. 
So is it my understanding that if I close it, the link will be made? I have it toggled to record. All right, we're going to find out what happens. I'm going to end the session here. If it gives me an opportunity to like tweet it or whatever, that's what I'll do. If not, you know, thanks for hanging out. <laughs> and I guess I'll talk with you by way of the uh, YouTube video tonight. Uh, just a reminder, I'm not doing videos on YouTube every single day. I only promise that this week. But uh, we'll resume with the normal schedule on Tuesday and Thursday next week going forward. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks for hanging out. Be safe.